few years ago, I went to a play uh, in Slovakia. My community, we have uh, a school, or at least one of my priest brothers is chaplain in the school, and a, a number of our sisters teach there. And periodically, they put on uh, a play, a big theater sketch, usually about a saint or something like that. And this particular year, they did uh, a guy called Jacques Fesch. He was a, uh, a French criminal who then converted. And a wonderful production, just really top drawer stuff. Um, wonderful choreography, singing, uh, wonderful set design, great acting. Just amazing that that secondary school kids could actually do something so good. And afterwards, of course, all the actors come out, you know, so you have the main, the main guy, the main girl. Sorry, no, you start off with the, with the pawns first. So your, your, your comic relief comes out, they get a bit of a big hour of applause, and your dancers come out and they get a kind of a applause. And then when your main characters come out, the place goes ballistic, you know what I mean? The, the characters that have been through uh, the, the whole story with you, uh, you know, they get a big round of applause, okay? And then at the end of it all, <clears throat> they said, and we want to thank uh, Sister Mary Marth for all of her background work. And when she came out, all the actors got to their feet and went absolutely ballistic because they had seen all of the work that she had put in behind the scenes that we as spectators didn't see at all. We saw, we didn't even see her during the play. We have no idea what she did or what she was doing or how she did it. No idea. But the actors, they did. They saw everything, every uh, uh, adjustment of the script, every attention to detail, every uh, attention to choreography and, and positioning on the stage and lighting and sound and music. And they even wrote songs for it. She saw all of that, and the actors knew it. We as spectators didn't necessarily. Why do I say that? Uh, in our reading of Genesis today, there's one word which is really key, which, we, which when you read quickly, obviously you just, you just uh, brush over and not really recognize the importance of. But it's what's called the, the Protoevangelos, like a summary of, of the Gospels, okay? Sin enters the world. <clears throat> Everything goes pear-shaped. And, or apple-shaped, and then, and then God brings it all back. And it's, this is all kind of summarized in, I will make you enemies of each other, you and the woman, your offspring and her offspring. It will crush your head, and you will strike its heel. Now, the it there is really, really important. Okay, I will make you enemies of each other. You, the ser so this is God speaking to the serpent. So the you is the serpent. I will make you enemies of each other, you and the woman. Your offspring, so the serpent's offspring, and her offspring. It will crush your head, and you will strike its heel. The it is a bit, sorry, this is just a small bit confusing, because, uh, who, who, sorry, who we, we've, got a, we've got a you, and we've got a her, and now suddenly we've got an it. So what are we talking about? Okay, there are, uh, as often happens with scripture, Scripture isn't always the easiest thing to translate. Um, languages don't always work the same way, and it can be quite difficult to, to, to understand at times in, an, in, in a language that's not yours, that was written 2,000 years ago with different uh, mentality and different even vocabulary, what the thing means. Okay, so <clears throat> the, the issue here is that the original Hebrew, not to lose you in too much detail, the original Hebrew, the Tanakh, says they, they will crush your head and you will strike their heel. They being the offspring, okay? So I will, I will make you em enemies of each other, you and the woman, your offspring, plural, the offspring, like plural, lots of kids or offspring, your offspring and her offspring, they will crush your head and you will strike their heel. Okay, that, that kind of makes sense. Um, Saint Jerome, in the Vulgate, so the original Latin translation of the scripture, he translates it she. So I will make you enemies of each other, you, and the woman, your offspring and her offspring, she will crush your head and you will strike her heel. And maybe in kind of a popular devotion, that's probably what we're more used to. We're used to these statues of Our Lady standing on a serpent. So she will crush the serpent of the head. Um, lots of even modern saints speak in these terms as well, Maximilian Kolbe and Padre Pio and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, this seems to, to fit popularly what, what, what we know. Okay, uh, most modern Bibles use he. So, I will make you enemies of each other, you, the serpent, and the woman, your offspring and her offspring, he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So your New Jerusalems 
uh, your uh, North American Bibles, your RSVs and RSVCEs, that's New Revised Catholic Edition, New Revised Standard Edition, Catholic Edition, New Revised Catholic Version, Catholic Edition, uh, NRSVCE, uh, that, that, that says he as well. Okay, so, uh, just to put all this together, which is it? Is it he, is it she, or is it they? Or, like, if it, part of the difficulty is, is, is that it's just, it's just not clear. It's just not clear. So what do we do? Now, anybody of a somewhat more pro Protestant persuasion might say, well, it obviously can't be she, right? The only one who can defeat Satan, <clears throat> the only one who will crush his head is Jesus, right? It wasn't Our Lady that died on the cross. It was Jesus. And we would say, absolutely. And yet, at the same time, <clears throat> Moses parted the Red Sea how? by working out a lot and learning how to control the elements of nature and having one heck of a mighty staff? No, Moses parts the Red Sea through the power of God. So a miracle has worked through him, but it's still God, okay? Uh, when the apostles come back rejoicing because people have been healed and demons have been cast out, was this again because the apostles had studied so much and had you know, learned how to control demons? No, it's all through the power of Christ anyway. So in a way, it's not one or the other, okay? So if we say it's she crushes uh, the, the, she will crush your head and you will strike her heel, is this okay? Well, as long as we correctly understand it, yes, she's the mother of God. So she's the mother of Jesus. She gives Jesus a human nature in which he can die on the cross, therefore defeating Satan. So it comes through her. It comes to her. So it's not, it's not one or the other. It's not like Jesus and Mary are competing for power. My goodness. No. <laughs> it just makes no theological sense at all. Uh, Mary, is, Mary, Mary doesn't want more power. She doesn't want to be going around crushing head, Satan's head. Like it, you know, it's not, but if the Lord entrusts a vocation to her, she will fulfill it. So through her, like even our, our vote of mass today, is Our Lady, the cause of our joy. You know, Our Lady, mediatrix of, of, of all grace, for example. This, these kind of ideas. Our Lady is great. Our Lady's greatness comes from her unity with, with Christ. So it's not one or the other. It's Jesus working through her. So if it's she, I'm perfectly okay with that. If it's they, her offspring, so the, the, the offspring of the woman, that's the church. The church working against Satan? It's the mystical body of Christ. Yes, it absolutely should work against Satan. Yeah, and if it's he, well, the most direct route, if you will, is, yes, of course, Satan is defeated by the cross. Satan is defeated by Jesus. So we have to be kind of careful not to, uh, to misunderstand the various translations that are out there. Because as I say, it's not, it's not the most straightforward. But uh, if we understand correctly, like, the, the, the bigger picture, what's going on in the background? In the background, Jesus does everything. Jesus is the source of all grace. So through every... Uh, every time a preacher preaches, every time a healer heals, every time a prophet prophesies, it's Jesus at work in them. Every time Our Lady does something, it's, it's, it's Jesus at work in her. Every time the Lord works directly, it's obviously Jesus at work. Every time the church does something, it's through the grace of God. So it's, 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 we shouldn't oppose these things uh, as if, as I say, Our Lady and, and Jesus are somehow competing. Not at all. So we see the consequences of sin. Consequences of sin are, are terrible. So man's unity with himself. So you know that, 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 that grace that we all want to be able to sit in a quiet chapel or in a quiet room and to simply be at peace with yourself. You know, that I, that it's kind of, for, for some, it's kind of an elusive idea. Just to be able to be at peace with yourself so like there's no distraction there's no phone no tv and just within yourself you're at peace not a kind of a new age inner peace kind of thing but just that that within myself yes there are difficulties and there are problems and there are demands on my time and there are stresses but lord i leave it in your hands i leave it in your hands and to be at peace with yourself and then being at peace with those around us that is also ruined by sin. So to be a pe the, the peace within oneself is ruined. When God asks Adam, 
Where were you? I heard the sound of you in the garden. He replied, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Who told you you were naked? Have you been eating of the tree I forbade you to eat? The man said, uh, it was the woman you put with me. Uh, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. His job was to protect her and have a bit of cop on as well. Uh, then, the woman, the, the, then God asked the woman, what's this you have done? The woman replied, uh, it was the serpent. Everyone's blaming everyone else. So this, this, this peace within oneself, this peace within humanity, <clears throat> this peace then with creation is all ruined. Even now, man's going to have to you know, till the soil and it, it, what will it yield but briars and thistles and brambles and you shall eat wild plants with the sweat of your brow. You shall eat your bread until you return to the soil, until you die, until you return to the soil. You know, so even, even like the harmony with nature, everything just becomes difficult, all because of sin. So, again, this is so relevant to today. Sin doesn't work. Right? Sin doesn't make you happy. And we can try and justify it, and we can dress it up, and we can make it look good, and we can make it look like progress. We can even make it look like compassion. Uh, abortion, for example. You can make it look like compassion. But sin doesn't work. It never ultimately leads to happiness. It may lead to a, a temporary thrill or it may lead to a temporary avoidance of a problem, but long term, it never works. It doesn't work because you will not be at peace with yourself, with those around you. You will not be at peace with God. Sin doesn't work. One last thought, if I may. Uh, this last paragraph here of our, of our reading, it, we always have to be careful um, when we come across difficult passages in scripture, okay? Uh, how do we interpret difficult passages? We have to be careful to always take scripture as a whole, not take one line and say, ah, it says here that God is vengeful. So there he is, God is vengeful, and he wants to just annihilate all sinners. You, you can't do that with scripture. You have to take scripture as a whole. So we interpret scripture in the light of the cross. So this is what God, this is what God is willing to do for us. He's willing to die on the cross for us. So if there's a line in scripture that makes him look vengeful or kind of capricious, you know, just kind of getting carried away by an angry mood, if I come across a line in scripture like that, I interpret it in the light of the cross. So can it be that God's just having a bad day and wants to destroy these people? Well, well, no, no. I mean, does that make sense in the light of the cross? Well, no, it doesn't. So then read around, get, get the context, have a look what's going on here, because it can't be that God is simply you know, vengeful or angry or, or, or whatever it be. Okay. So, well, vengeful or angry in human terms. We, we won't go into that. That's another, another theme. But when we look at this, the last paragraph, there's one little, one, one beautiful detail and then something that's kind of confusing. So we'll just have a quick look at both of those. The man, the man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all those who live. The Lord God made clothes out of skins for the man and his wife and they put them on. The Lord made clothes for them. Stitching away he was. So they commit sin. They ruin the harmony of creation. And the Lord sits down and makes them clothes. Isn't that beautiful detail? Like, do you ever notice that? You know, like rather than just saying, just get out, get out of my sight. I'm just sick of the lot of you. All right, just go away. All right, close them doors. Angels, big fiery swords, stay right there. He doesn't. He sits down and he sews them clothes. But they can't stay in, in, in harm, harm, the harmony of paradise has been ruined. So they can't stay in Eden. They must, they must go until the situation has been resolved. Okay, but, but he takes care of them. Right? He's not just kind of losing the plot and get out of my sight. That, that, that's not God. Look at the details. Right? The Lord made clothes out of skins for man and his wife. And they put them on. Now... Another little detail here for me. Then the Lord God said, See, man has become like one of us with his knowledge of good and evil. He must not be allowed to stretch out his hand next and pick from the tree of life also and eat some and live forever. It sounds like, hang on, uh, why is God holding back? Why, is God, why, does God not, why, is, why does God somehow feel threatened by man? So the Lord God expelled him from Eden to till the soil from which he had been taken. Okay. Why was it then that God didn't want them to reach out and take from the tree of life and live forever? Why? Because they had just fallen. 
in, in the state that they were in. They were in a fallen state. Sin had entered their hearts. Their hearts were corrupt. You don't want to live forever with a corrupt heart. That's not the time to live together. Get, live forever. Get purified first. This is our life here. So we're given life. We fall. We make mistakes. Hopefully, the plan is that throughout our lives, we will grow in virtue. The Lord provides us with, with opportunities every single day to grow in virtue. And then towards the end of our lives, a lot of the distractions are taken away. Uh, as we get older, it doesn't really matter to us anymore if our hair has a certain style. It doesn't really matter. As long as it's holding on and there's something there, we're kind of happy enough with that. So, you know, it doesn't really matter if you have your own teeth. I remember my granny, she used to kind of put them in half the time and not put them in the other half of the time. Frightened the life out of me, you know, when, she, when you'd walk in and she'd be able to kind of, with her bottom jaw, practically swallow her face. It was, it was quite a gift, a skill. But, um, so, but it doesn't matter at that age, like, that, who cares? Like, you know, it doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter what clothes you wear anymore. It the pool out the back, sure, jeepers, I'd I, I, I dislocate a hip if I went into it. Like, it just doesn't matter, okay? And then even like what you considered important, your, your intelligence to that, your, your memory start, might start to fail you. So little by little, in our, in our latter years, we haven't, this, this isn't, remember, God taking his gifts back, but he's giving us an opportunity to give everything back so that he will be our all, so that we're ready for heaven. You understand? You see how it works? Like there's, 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 there's method in, in, what, in what the Lord is doing here. So as we get older, our life becomes simplified so that our, our focus should start to, to narrow and say, Lord, I've done all sorts of things and I've started a company and I'm, I employed a thousand people and we had all sorts of Spanish holidays and a house in the Cote d'Azur and I've all, had all sorts of amazing cars and 14 children and the whole lot. And now that all that's done, Lord, I realize that I've, I've taken my eyes off you. I've taken my focus off you. And I haven't been concentrated on the only thing that ultimately matters, which is heaven, eternal life with you. And now that, my, now that I'm retired, and now that people can't visit me, I have lots of time. I have lots of time to get ready for heaven. I have lots of time to pray. I have lots of time to unite myself to you. See, see the, the, the gift, the gift of old age. It, everything is simplified. And then we get ready to live forever, but in a purified state. And if we're not 100% ready by the time the sand runs through our wee timer, uh, then there's purgatory. Again, purgatory to purge, to clean, to finish this purification process that we can get back into heaven purified and ready to live forever not live forever in a fallen state living forever in a fallen state is called hell so the Lord has a plan and, and this, this all makes sense and it's, just, it's amazing how much is squashed into these few verses in, in Genesis it's quite dense and very very beautiful so we ask the good Lord today to renew our understanding of his mercy to renew our understanding of Our Lady's greatness. Not that she has greatness in and of herself. She co-works perfectly with every grace given her. She doesn't get in the way. And she allows that grace to flow from her pure heart. She allows or she accepts this gift of universal motherhood. Her motherhood for each one of us. We pray that she will crush the serpents in our lives, the serpents of addiction, the serpents of temptation and laziness and impurity and pride, arrogance, godlessness, worldliness. We pray, Lord, that each little serpent that raises its ugly head in our lives and in our consciences may be crushed by her pure foot, united to her son. Amen.